Uh, I'm Andy. I've uh, been coming to meet up for a while. I just wanted to start off by thanking Christian and Joel for hosting these. There have been 10 of these so far, so we do appreciate that. I'll be talking a little bit about uh, dominant assurance contracts, which I think of as sort of a variation on Kickstarter. It's sort of like Kickstarter with skin in the game where the entrepreneur puts in some money. Okay, so I'll just be talking about some business models on the blockchain, similar to what Christian did. Um, looking at some older funding models, looking at crowdfunding specifically, uh, how you might write a Kickstarter contract on Ethereum, um, what the differences are between a dominant assurance contract and a Kickstarter contract are, and then you know some new variants I kind of cooked up over the weekend um, to a dominant assurance contract. Okay, so there are a lot of different uh, things you can do with the blockchain. So if you're new to Ethereum, it's basically like the Bitcoin blockchain, except that you have a fully Turing complete, which is to say a full programming language scripting capability on top of the chain. So instead of just sending tokens, uh, sending money back and forth, there are all kinds of different things you can do. Um, Ledra Capital has a fantastic uh, sort of brainstorming list of things that you can do um, with the blockchain. Number 12 on that list is uh, is actually um, crowdfunding. But I mean, here's some of the things you can do. Uh, Subcurrencies on Ethereum, private equity issu issuance, public equities, bonds, derivatives we talked about, voting rights and voting models, commodities, spending records, trading records. You can see quite a long list. Number 12 is crowdfunding, but it includes registration for things like, you know, all kinds of public records. Um, it even gets kind of exotic. I mean, we even have things like uh, wills, signatures, trusts, uh, semi-public records like degrees. You know, there's a, a thread on the forum about um, I'm involved in healthcare, so patient records, hospital records, uh, all kinds of smart property. Um, as long as the smart property has a proclet, which is to say an RFID tag or an, you know an IPv6 address, it's, it can be talked to or or there can be business logic built on Ethereum. You can control all of these different things. And then, you know, a number of intangibles. Um, is there anything on the, is there, is there something you can do on the internet that you cannot do using Ethereum? I'd be hard pressed to think of one because we're talking about a Turing complete oh, programming I mean, language. No, no, sure there is. I mean, there's, you, you can't, you're not gonna sit, even though- but There are a couple of things that are really bad. I mean, yeah. I would not do, I personally would not do a market on Ethereum, and I'll tell you why. If I have to process, if I have to do high frequency trading, for example, of anything, you know, there are a thousand better products for that. I mean, with a block time of one minute, if I wanted to do real time chat, probably not. I've got like a two or three minute window. So you've got that time limitation. You've got scalability limitation. I don't want to put giant movies on the blockchain, probably. We don't know what the cost of each is going to be yet, but. Massive amounts of storage, you probably wouldn't want to host there. I mean, there are use cases that you, I mean, sure, you could do a lot of things, you know, but there are things that you wouldn't want to do on the Com computer. Computation, high computation. Yeah, massive amounts of computation. Cheaper to do locally. But in terms of contracts and storage, um, there's a lot you can do with Ethereum. So that's kind of speculative. Those are things you could do on a blockchain. Um, and you could not really do a lot of those with Bitcoin because of scripting language limitations. Uh, we talked about crowdfunding. So if you're into crowdfunding, it's the collection of uh, finance and sustainable initiative from a large pool of backers, which is to say the crowd, going directly to the crowd. Um, this is not a new model. Uh, you know, patrons of the arts have been around for you know a number of years. Um, that's sort of a direct you know, forerunner to this. We also have this the old subscription model part of magazines where artists would, you know, solicit funds to release a piece of music. You know, Mozart and, and uh, Beethoven did this to finance some of their pieces of music. In fact, they used a sort of a Kickstarter model where if they had enough funding, they would do the full orchestra, but if they didn't, they would do a four-piece ensemble. Um, so this has been around a long time. So the, the major four types are donation-based where 
you're just pledging some money, either an escrow or a promise to pledge, and all you get back in return is a thank you. That's quite common when you look at PBS. Reward-based, similar to Kickstarter, you're going to get some kind of reward back. It's not equity. You know, it might be a t-shirt, it might be swag, or tchotchkes, or early access to something, or, you know, um, perhaps a price discount. Credit-based is increasingly common with sites like uh, Prosper, which is more like a, it's sort of like a peer-to-peer -peer lending concept. So you're you're taking out the financial intermediary of the bank and you're you're doing peer-to-peer -peer lending on a platform. And then the last one is equity-based, and that's a relatively new thing. Um, that's where we're sort of providing some type of uh, some type of equity in exchange for the funding. And you sort of have to be careful with that because there are lots of rules around you know. What is an equity issuance? What is an IPO? Uh, regulations vary significantly by country. But there is a nice comparison of uh, platforms and services on Wikipedia. So Kickstarter is an example of Type 2. It's a multi-level reward-based uh, platform. It's a pledge threshold-based system. So basically an example is, I'm a project initiator. I have to raise $10,000 in 30 days or all the pledges are refunded. If I have a successful campaign, you know, there might be difficult words that I give. If you funded two or three hundred dollars, I'll give you the t-shirt. If you funded five thousand dollars, you get to have lunch with me. Uh, Ten thousand dollars, you know, you, I don't know, trip to Disneyland with the whole team, I don't know, something like that. Quite common, um, but it has its limitations. For example, the funding structure is such that the platform takes five percent. That's a lot. And then the Amazon payments takes between three and five percent. So that's 8% right off the top. That's intermediation that could be the middleman that could be gotten rid of. Um, and it doesn't have a stellar success rate. I mean, it's, it's cumulative, it's 43.99. And that's for a 30-day campaign. 60-day campaigns drops to 29%. Most successful projects raise less than 10K. If you want a successful project, it better be on the front page because 85% of those are successful, but how do you get on the front page? So there are limitations to this. Um, some big success stories, the Pebble E-Watch came in at 10 times the funding target, so they were overfunded. Same with Ouya, which is a uh, you know, sort of an open game console. The Veronica Mars film came in at 2.8. And I want to talk a little later about Oculus VR. These are the makers of the virtual reality headset. Uh, they raised $2 million and were recently acquired by Facebook, but I want to talk more about that later. There have been a number of sort of big failures. Kobe beef jerky, which was basically a $120,000 fraud. There have been other um, campaigns that have been canceled for IP infringement, for violating terms of service. And in some cases, and I want to get to this later, for basically delivering less than they promised. I mean, in, in many cases, with all good intentions, a project initiator might bite off more than they can chew. What happens when the project is fully funded, but the project initiator cannot deliver? Either deliver partially or, or not deliver completely or not deliver on time. So what happens? So net-net, we're talking about a less than 50% success rate, and the bulk of the, these successes are beneath the $10,000 threshold. And in some categories, and I think there are 11 categories for Kickstarters, games, design, and certain tech um, actually fare, wor fare worse than the 43.99%. So, what to do? Um, we talked about cutting out the middleman by basically writing Ethereum, an Ethereum smart contract on the Kickstarter model. You would still need a, a web front end, which we just talked about in the last, because, in the last uh, presentation, because you need something user friendly for um, for you know, contributors to be able to get on, and they're probably not going to want to manually send you know, um, either transactions on the client as it exists today. Um, if they don't have the uh, Ethereum client, you know, you might want some kind of gateway to just bring money into the Ethereum blockchain. So Alex on the forums, and uh, he's actually out of Vienna. He's kind of working independently on a Kickstarter contract using the uh, the high-level language. And I was doing the same. 
And uh, we came up with, and I won't actually show you raw code, but just sort of some pseudo code. You know, you need a few things when you when you have a, a Kickstarter campaign, you need to know, you know, who the contract creator was, you need to have a target date for when the campaign ends, you need to know the funding amount and the target funding amount. If you want to figure out how much Ethereum it would cost to run a contract where you have to refund all the money, you need to know how many donors you have. And then you need to store a place to store the address of the donor and how much they donated, which is not, this is not the most elegant or efficient way to do this. The, the elegant or efficient way that Alex uses uses a key value store with a lookup table, but you know, I'll just go and burn my 32 bytes here and there, I don't mind, you know, just for the sake of simplicity. Um, every time you run an Ethereum contract, you want to make sure that it has enough Ether to run successfully to completion, no matter what branch of the, of the contract you're running through. On the first run of the contract, most contracts, you're going like, to initialize some permanent storage to say, okay, these are the campaign parameters. How many days till the campaign's complete? What's the target funding? For the second and you know future runs of the contract, where donors are actually you know donating funds to your campaign, um, you need to see if the uh, the contract's expired. And if it's expired and the goal's been met, then you send the balance to the project initiator and suicide the contract. Uh, if the contract's expired and the funding target has not been yet, you actually have to loop through that storage and send all those funds back to the donors. That's a requirement. If the contract's not expired, then even if it's fully funded, you should uh, basically uh, store the donor address and the amount that they've donated. The nice thing about Ethereum is, you know, you can do a lot of this with comments with less than 100 lines of code. Uh, and that's nice. So, that's Kickstarter, but that's not really what I'm talking about today. We all know Kickstarter. I'm going to talk about dominant insurance contracts, which is a variation on Kickstarter. So, in 1996, Alex Navarrock, uh, George Michigan University, kind of came up with this concept of a dominant assurance contract, and it's similar to what uh, Groupon uses today as, as the model. So what happens, what's a little different about a, a dominant assurance contract or a Kickstarter with, with skin in the game is the project initiator will pay you a prize if the campaign fails. So not only will you get your refund, or if it's a pledge, you never sent the money anyway. You will get ROI, so, um, and I'll give you an example of this at the bottom. In addition to that, the project initiator has the capability of taking a profit. They can actually ask for more money than the cost of the project. Of course, you don't know what the real cost of the project is of the donor, but I'll give you an example. So the typical Kickstarter example is, I need $10,000 in the next 30 days in order to build, I don't know, a new bike. Well, with a dominant assurance contract, I would take that same, that same goal, building a bike, and I would say, I need $12,000 in the next 30 days, and if I don't get it, I will split $1,000 with each of the donors, in addition to their full refund. So, um, what does this solve? It solves the free rider problem. So, the free rider problem goes something like this. Um, why should I donate? If I don't donate, if I'm a slacker, let's say, or I'm not interested, I don't donate, uh, and it's successful, everyone's going to get it anyway. However, if I'm interested in the product and I'm a contributor, why do I want to contribute and tie up my money for 30 days? Because I have no assurance that anyone else is going to do this. So it solves that problem, basically. If you don't do anything, you're out of luck. If you do contribute, and the, the, the campaign fails, you will get a return on investment. If the campaign succeeds, you will get the good. Now, the interesting thing about this, and, and Joel was really quick to point this out, and this is a, one of their central criticisms, well, if I'm just in it for the money, I mean, we're all gonna see what's on the chain. It's not hidden information. We're basically just gonna bid up right until the point where the contract is not funded, and just wait. Well, there's a couple of things that, that, that happen there. The first is, the initiator can always take in more money and take less profit. That's option one. 
But option two is, in that scenario, if you were just funding this because you had no interest whatsoever in the product and you were just in it for the money, then theoretically, this Kickstarter, if this was a, a vanilla Kickstarter campaign, it would get zero funding. None. So there's a variant of this that addresses that. But, but this, this would be a campaign where if, if everyone was just in it for the money on the donation side and no one cared about the product, this would have completely failed Kickstarter. There would be zero donations on that Kickstarter campaign. The product's probably going to die anyway. So, um, some benefits. The project initiators can profit. You don't know that the bike's going to cost me 10k to make. I'm going to say it costs 12k now. So what's the problem with this? Well, the Kickstarter guy probably would have built it for 10k. Well, there's a market there, right? If I say it's going to cost 20k to build, and I have a com competitor, somebody else who wants to do the same thing or something very close to it for 15k. Well, guess what? They're going to go with the 15k option. There's a market there. So you can't just, as the project initiator, ramp up the profit to whatever you want. There's a market there. Like an example would be, say, you know, building a bridge. I'm going to build a bridge in, I don't know, 30 days over a creek or something. Um, you know, company A is going to build it for 20k. Company B is going to build it for 15. Everyone's going to get behind company B. So that's just common sense. They get the same public good at the end of it, but they pay less for it. Um, perception or optics, you know, if I'm in this and I'm putting some of my own money as the entrepreneur into this, doesn't it look a little more believable, like I'm serious about this, I'm putting my own money up at risk if I don't succeed? I really want to succeed. I want to succeed so much that, let's say I was asking for 12000 and we were at, say, I don't know, the $10,000 mark. I might, just to avoid, you know, having to fork out the prize money, I might just donate the difference and eat some of my profit away just to make sure that this thing is a success and I haven't wasted my time. So this has been tried a few times. One of them was by uh, Jason Quinn, who did uh, a campaign just like this on board from the, the Center for Election Science. Basically he said, um, I need a $60 pledge, I need 15 of them, but I will give everyone five bucks if this doesn't work. And what happened was, just like an auction, right up to the last minute, you know, there was a like flurry of activity right up to the last minute. So if he hadn't offered the prize, because it's not exactly exciting stuff, Center for Election Science, right? Um, it probably would not have succeeded. But, you know, we have to do, you know, there has to be more, basically, you know, validation of the model. There are some variants, though, that you could do with this. So. Um, one is the prize or the refund bonus if this thing fails. It could be proportional to the amount of money you put in. So in the example, I need $12,000 30 days. So uh, Joel here doesn't care about mountain bikes. And Joel's maybe the only one I've told about this because I have not done my job promoting this from a marketing standpoint. Joel puts in a cent. And Joel is hoping this gets buried and no one ever hears about this. Because if, it, if it's a cent, Joel gets a thousand bucks if no one puts any money in. And Joel likes that. That's, that's Joel's kind of return. Joel's eating that up. So the first thing I'm going to do, the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a hundred bucks in, or at least a buck in, as the project initiator. Now you don't know, I'll just pick another Ethereum address so you don't really know it's me. It doesn't matter. But I don't, I'm, not paying, I'm not paying a thousand bucks to Joel. I mean, I like the guy and all, but you know. I don't have to do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pay him out proportional to what he put in. So if Joel puts in a cent and I put in a buck, you know, Joel gets 1% of the prize and I get 99 and I'm happy. I mean, I've only lost a little bit, you know. Um, so there's some incentivization to at least match donations if, if you know, you're not meeting the target. Um, the other thing about this which is interesting, the paper discusses a situation where it's, it's, it's sort of like this game theory prisoner dilemma thing with some heavy math, but he actually models it as if people don't know what other people have donated to the campaign. Well, in Ethereum, everything's public. So people will know. And um, another, another criticism of this was, if people don't know, well, then people will just start advertising. Joel will be out there and say, and Joel's put it as one cent, no one's heard about it, but 
But let's say other people have heard about it and they, they're on the fence, they don't know whether to, to donate or not. Joel's just going to say, oh, don't donate. I mean, we're already almost at the cap. I mean, all my friends have already donated. I'm sure, of course, Joel's incentivized to lie because if no one else donates, Joel gets all the money. So, so that's, kind of a, that's kind of a red herring. Like, whether or not the information is hidden doesn't really matter in this model. Um, okay, so we just talked about um, you know, previously, what happens if the campaign is successful and the product sucks? It does not meet the funder's expectations. There's a couple of classical examples of this. The, the most successful, like, old-school patronage contract ever was Pope Julius II uh, asking Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel. It was an interesting story because Michelangelo did not want to paint the Sistine Chapel at all. It was four years of sweat and toil. I'm a sculptor, I'm not a painter. I wasn't even his first pick. I hate this stuff. But the only reason I'm doing this is A, I'm in Italy and he's the Pope, and B, he's pointing me off his other job, which was to, to basically sculpt his tomb. Okay, I'll do it. And then, um, and I don't think the money was very good either, actually. Uh, this turned into the most successful crowdfunding ever. Uh, well, if you, call it, if you call it Catholic Church crowdfunding, but, but, but if you think about it for a minute, this is the, you know, uh, the creation of Adam in the Sistine Chapel is the, the best-known Western artwork there is. The only thing that comes even close to this is the Mona Lisa. And from a crowdfunding perspective, the Sistine Chapel is more important because the patron, which is to say the Catholic Church that first paid for it, still gets the, the benefit of it. First of all, they get all the tourist funding. The organization, like, it's got a long-lived organization, but, but the patron is still enjoying the benefits of this work that they commissioned. Even today, you know, people go to the Vatican and they probably donate more because they want to see the Sistine Chapel. And it's functional. The papal enclave uh, actually needs to elect the Pope in that chapel. But we'll talk about voting systems later. They actually use a two-thirds vote, which theoretically they could do on Ethereum. And it also costs $16 to enter. And it costs $16 to enter. So even today, they're making... 16 euros. 16 euros. So even today, you know, 500 years later, they're, they're making money off, off that... Uh, off that initial. There's an example of one that really failed. So I don't know if you guys know, but Nelson Rockefeller in 1932, if you ever watched the show, the show uh, 30 Rock, that building, the GE building at 30 Rockefeller Plaza, he commissioned uh, Diego Rivera. Not his first choice, he wanted Picasso, his mom liked Diego Rivera, okay, he was a third choice, we'll get him to paint something. Painted a mural called uh, Man at the Crossroads. It's actually quite an impressive piece of work. The problem was, Diego Rivera was a Mexican socialist and insisted that Lenin's face be on the mural, and of course Nelson Rockefeller was not a fan of uh, Vladimir Lenin. So there was a big fight about this. And uh, Diego tried to say, well, okay, I'll meet you halfway. You're a Republican, uh, Abraham Lincoln's a Republican, I can, I can tolerate, I'll put him on as well. Not good enough. The mural was so big, and it was $21,000, the mural was so big and fully funded, uh, it was not quite completed, but it was so big it couldn't be moved. Everyone tried to save it. It was a wonderful piece of art. It could not be saved, and Rockefeller sandblasted it and had a much lesser known painter, uh, who's just absurd, basically paint what is there today, which is uh, called American Progress, and it's uh, basically got Abraham Lincoln as a theme. So that's an example of, hey, I paid for this. I fully funded it. It is not meeting my needs. And so, you know, Diego Rivera, he got a lot of money for 1932, but he could, nobody else wanted to use him as an artist in North America after that. I mean, he basically recreated this in Mexico, but nobody in Canada or the U.S. Wanted, wanted him as an artist. So he lost a lot of commissions because he believed in something very strongly. At the same time, Rockefeller was up 21 grand, which is not a lot for him. But um, that's, a, that's an example of something that fails. There was no funder acceptance test, right? You could have a model of this contract, and I, I was thinking about this over the weekend, where goods must pass some kind of vote after they've been funded and completed. And because, and so this is a bit of a typo, because the donors don't know what the profit for the, the project initiator was in this model, the donors could, could stipulate in the contract, well, if it doesn't meet our needs with, say, a 50% vote or a two-thirds vote, then we want some multiple of the prize money returned to us. Even though we'll lose a bit because we fully funded your project, 
We want to be compensated because this did not meet our requirements, which were set up front. Um, uh, and in, in exchange for that, basically, the, the initiator probably would not release the product to the public. So this would be a way to uh, punish, you know, pump and dump guys who basically come in and say, yeah, I can, I can, you know, I can build a skyscraper for 30 bucks. Uh, you know, if they're fully funded and they don't deliver, there has to be some kind of, they forego their, basically they forego their profit, probably, uh, but they'll also forego a multiple of the prize money they would have awarded. <coughs> so that can be set up. But the really exciting thing I want to get to is uh, this equity idea. So for those of you that have followed the news, um, Oculus VR is a company that does virtual reality headsets, and they had a very, very successful fundraiser, I think, two, three years ago. They raised $2 million. Uh, they raised their funding goal in something like 36 hours. On, on over, Kickstarter. On Kickstarter. And over the course of the four months, I think they raised $2 million. And then the chronology of events, just from memory, goes something like this. Uh, Andreessen Horowitz kicked in another $97 million. Uh, and then they lured uh, John Carmack, who's the CTO today, but he was one of the founders of its software. So if you've ever played first person shooters like Doom, you know this guy, or Quake, you know this guy really well. Um, and then uh, they were selling software development kits for a while and, you know, some prototype hardware. And uh, on May 25th, they announced they just sort of sent out their, uh, uh, I guess, a beta or an alpha prototype of their headset. Oh, pretty good. And just that day, Mark Zuckerberg announced that he bought them for $2 billion. Now, that's, that's a lot of money, two, million, two million, two years later, two billion, right? A uh, thousand times return, that's big. So, <laughs> I'm 42, so when I talk to my young friends, you know, they're in their 20s, they're, you know, the guys hanging out at the coffee shop or wherever, they're, they're mad. You know, they don't like this. You know, they, they donated to the Kickstarter. Even the, the creator of Minecraft, uh, Marcus Pearson or Notch, He's not a big fan of this acquisition. I mean, are they just hiring him because they well, want to? Well, yeah, if you want to wear a television set on your head. Yeah. 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 It ain't going to work. Well, well, that's just it. So, so what happened? I mean, the pure gamers were mad because they sold out to Facebook. Yeah, I've tried it. The, the, Facebook, the Facebook stockholders, it took a bit of a dip because it's sort of like, what's Mark doing, right? But you know what's funny is, is the gamers, the young guys, the guys like Notch who, who are game developers that, that put in money to the Kickstarter, they feel cheated. I wanted a piece of the action, you know, where's my equity? You know, if I had only bought, this is kind of like, I really should have bought that Bitcoin in 2010, you know? <laughs> they got that sort of feeling going on, and they're mad about it. So, in this model, what you could theoretically do is, so let's say you've got a dominant insurance contract, and it's funded, and the product meets the spec, and it gets the, uh, the FAT, the uh, funder acceptance test, meets that, okay? You might not even need a funder acceptance test. You could then convert, using an Ethereum subcurrency, you could convert the, uh, the donations into shares, or call them subcurrency units because that's funded for the SEC. And at that point, you have a, a piece of the action. You have some kind of share, let's say, in Oculus VR. You have subcurrency. So what can you do with the subcurrency? Well, you could use it to vote on things. Like, let's say I'm building a bridge. I'm building the Golden Gate again, let's say. Only I'm doing it with, a, with an Ethereum dollar insurance contract, and I'll just say it costs ten thousand um, dollars, just to keep it simple. And I made a two thousand dollar profit on that, but it's funded. So now I could say, for example, only the funders get to use the bridge. Everyone else uses the toll booth, or everyone else has to buy the video game. The funders got it for free, or everyone else, you know, everyone else buys the bike, but the funders, you know, the funders got if they funded enough, they they got the bike. Well, now you're making a profit, right? So, so this organization is accruing money, perhaps it's on Ethereum. And you could have, using these shares, you could vote how much and when to have a dividend on that profit. You could actually get a piece of the action. You could have voting rights to issue a dividend, you know, with the organization based on its profit. So you're sort of turning the campaign from a dominant insurance contract into its own decentralized autonomous organization or corporation. So that's that's the idea of, uh, you could, so you can do, actually do with subcurrencies, you can do equity crowdfunding with Ethereum, you just issue a subcurrency. And uh, then you can vote with it, you can trade it on a market, um, you, could, you, could, you could vote on issuing dividends on profits, maybe I sell my product in Ether units, 
and we issue dividends in ether units, but we vote on dividend issuance with the you know Andy Corp subcurrency. And you got some because you funded the uh, the Kickstarter with skin in the game. So anyway, that's all I had. Um, next steps basically got a code and test, try it out, front ends, rinse and repeat, uh, and then integrate the code base into uh, Skynet. So thanks everybody. If there are any questions, just let me know. I hope No, I haven't. So it's, it's actually very relevant to this. Okay. Uh, as far as I understand, there's a medical crowd. Uh, there's a medical device company that claims to have a non-invasive glucose measurement device, which has all these doctors and people like very, very excited. And they said they're based in San Francisco. It looks like they're actually based in Russia. And there's some problems. It looks kind of problematic. Mm. I'm uh, diabetic. I probably would have bought that too. Yeah, exactly. that, yeah. So now people who have already funded it are like sort of upset about it and. Uh, yeah, so it seems like the, uh, I mean, this is at one end of the spectrum where it might actually be a, like a malicious. Right, uh, so there's no fat there, there's no funder assurance test. Like maybe for a medical device you want to pass FDA approval as the fat, as the funder assurance test. They should pay a penalty. Yeah. If they can't fully refund the funders, they should pay some kind of penalty. So I guess my, my question is, the, the concern that, I mean, when you were describing this, like the, the funder's acceptance test, what I think of is, that in theory it would attract the most qualified of the projects because they would have no reason to, they would be, they would know like, oh, we can manufacture this, we can ship it, we're not worried about not passing this test. But I think in reality what you might see is that the most qualified projects would say, oh, this looks like a massive headache, we must not even bother with this. Right, well, it's an optional clause, so remember that there's a market, so the, the project initiator can opt to include or not include a funder acceptance test or can solicit opinions about Okay, we're going to have a funder acceptance test. What goes into it? What are the parameters? What's the voting threshold? What are the parameters? Yeah, or something where the, the funders can propose. They say, I will fund this if, if it uses this test or something. Exactly. If they all group together and they have like a consortium, sure. I mean, like, like, a, like a group of people that, that come to the project initiator and propose. That's usually how it happens. You know, in the old days, the, uh, the patron of the arts like shows up and says, hey, I need my, my wall painted. Like, right? here's the deal. Possible problem, and maybe you've already thought of it. Um, so, so I create a campaign, right? And I say there's going to be some funder assurance test, and you know it looks good on paper. Then I proceed through the campaign. I buy, say, 70% of the campaign, up, and I wait for the other 30% to be filled in by not me. Right. So you know, say there's $10 in the campaign, and I'm going to make $3,000 a week. So that that campaign is fully funded at $10 a week. I have the voting rights for 70% of it, so I can, I can rubber stamp any fund, funder assurance test. Is that correct? No, well, what would happen is that the funder assurance test is, is independent. So, oh, you, yeah, you, you could rubber stamp. Could you I repeat suppose. the scenario? I didn't quite so get it. So the scenario would be there's, there's a big whale who, who is buying up 70% of the campaign, okay? So the whale has 70% of the campaign, and everyone else has the remaining 30% of the, the funding period. So we get, and by the way, I cooked up the funder assurance test like this afternoon. But anyway, um, so he's saying, basically saying there could be some kind of collusion maybe, or or basically you could rubber stamp the assurance test because you have more than 50% of the voting rights. I'm the whale of the initiator. Yeah. Right. Oh, you're the same person. Yeah, so I want, I want that $3 at the end for my Oh, okay, so you're the, oh, that's that's interesting. You're, the, you're both the initiator and the person who chipped in 70%. Well, it's pretty it's easy, it's easy to see who's contributing. Yeah, you can, well, can you really see who's contributing? Not if they all use separate ether addresses. But you you have this uh, this uh, reputation thing. If if somebody is creating a brand new uh, address just to contribute, then right. you could you could see that. I mean, you can as, also... as a as an initiator of a project. I'm probably going to pitch in something close to the prize money if I'm in trouble. If I'm the initiator of a project, I'm not sure I would fund it at 70%. I mean, why do I need to raise money to begin with if I can already fund 70% of it? And I should just have a campaign for 30% of that money, you know, what's outstanding. What I really want to go, is, is this a way to gain the assurance 
test, basically. Yeah, so basically, yeah. I put up seven of my own money. Right. Everybody else contributes three, but in the end, I take the three and get my money back as well. So <laughs> I've made a three off my seven. So he's scamming me. Yeah, he's scamming me. I'm just like. Yeah, well, we got to look at it. That's true. <laughs> yeah, you got to look at it. There's different ways you could pass the uh, the vote. There's no guarantee. Like, let's say, let's say we did the voting, and the voting rule was not um, proportional to the donation. It's every donor gets a vote. Or, or it's proportional to the donor, but I need an eighty percent quorum to pass to pass the test. There's a lot of ways you could do that, you know. Um, but I do have to look at it. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, you can look at the, uh, his blog post on the Ethereum website about the shelling coins. Yeah, so shelling coins are really interesting. So this is a way to um, do a, a trusted oracle or a trusted uh, data feed and uh, reward people who are close to the medium. Maybe, maybe you can do something where instead of it being a, like an exchange ratio, maybe a, a pass fail or right. So, so the you know, I, like, sort of the, the funder assurance test is to sort of have faith. I just thought about it, but I mean, the alternative is there's no funder assurance test, and we get medical devices that don't really exist, and we get paintings we don't want, and we get IP infringement, and we get you know, I mean, there's gotta we're trying to put up some kind of some kind of bar, uh, but yes, it could be scammed. Sure, I have to think about it. So in the real world, contracts are not absolute. Um, if it ends up in a bad situation, you go to a judge and you say these conditions were unconsciousable, I wasn't supposed to be taken advantage of like this. All kinds of things can happen that can change contracts. If you're going to start putting contracts into the bit chain and they're absolute, you almost need like, you know, some uncle who's trusted by everybody, an arbiter or something to be able right. to. So that there's... Be out of coding errors even. Yeah, so there's, uh, there's talk of... Well, you know, the obvious one is uh, is arbitration, right? So we, you know, we all agree as as parties to the contract that we're going to choose this, this, and this um, dispute resolution system, and then we have to abide by it. Yeah, it's, it's messy, but coding errors can happen. Yeah, and but and that can still be, and that piece can still be coded in the contract. So it's multi-sig. Basically, basically the arbiter is one of the one of the signatories, and you know it's. It's a quorum of donators plus the arbiter, let's say, or it could be done. It could be done in the contract. I'm less concerned about arbitration or about lack of specification in the contract, so immediately it's arbitration. Which is a book. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there'll be a whole class of people that uh, test and review contracts. I'm so sure. party shots? Party shots? Well, I don't know. I, you know, there's a lot of different models out there. We should we should just give some of these a try. Definitely. What? So earlier you were talking about the price for unfunded contracts, so right. you raise 10, or you raise 12, and 10 is funded, and you get some for everyone. And then you said that it would drive the initiators to not try to overvalue the project? They, they would not over the value, overvalue the project because uh, Christian could come along and build your bike for less and ask for less. It would be a market. But, but if there's this, so I kind of think of this through this prize that people know about, and you see one product and you say, that's a great product, it's to get funded. The odds of me getting refunded are not there. Right. But I can then go and do something very similar that's not as good and then value it higher. And then everyone else would just kind of jump in. Kind of with the understanding that if you a good project, if you get funded, the odds of my less specific project will not. And then therefore you can kind of, so I can kind of see that that turns into, you know. Yeah, so the question is if, if you're just in it as a donor, if you're just in it for the money, and nothing, and you don't care a whit about the project at all, and it's not an equity, right. then the Kickstarter donations to that project under the vanilla Kickstarter model would be zero, because you don't care. And that's not a recipe for success. No one cares about your product. Right. right. Could be an investment model. Yeah, yeah. So most of those people would want like, the equity option because they just care about the bottom line. They don't, they don't care what the product is. They'll buy Coke stock, they'll buy oil stock. They don't care. They just want to make some money. So they, they would want a piece of the equity and they would want a profit share at the end of this. Like, you know, if, if, if it was successful, people were buying the product, 
they would want voting rights on a dividend issue and stuff like that. Yeah, the, the within the current legal framework is a difficult problem because of the many jurisdictions, right? So you would have to specify in the contract if you wanted to interface with the current legal system. If this was any, if this was to be treated as a legal contract and not just some program we're all running, because to be safe, I would treat it as a program we're all just voluntarily running. Uh, what I would do is I would have to specify the jurisdiction in the contract and have it checked over by uh, by a lawyer. In some cases, you can do things like, in the smart contract, um, I'm sorry, the smart property examples for business models, you know, there's not a lot of smart property out there. We don't have cars, we don't have smart homes, we don't have smart cars, we don't have smart keys, we don't have things that can link up to Ethereum yet. It's not impossible to do that with sensor technology and, and naming, but what you can do is you can have a paper contract that says, this car with this VIN number, um, you know, and spell out the contract in English, references this Ethereum contract, which will be a tool used in the paper contract, and the Ethereum contract has this address. And, you know, based on some of the previous presentations we've had, as long as there is a, uh, I think it's an offer, a consideration, and a meeting of minds, you have a legal contract. And so you could actually have a hybrid contract where the, smart pro the dumb property, which is not smart yet, uh, is still in the paper old school legal world, and we're interfacing that with an Ethereum smart contract as a certain appendage to it until we get to everything being smart and self enforceable. Okay, it seems to be like the only thing that can really be enforceable is Ether within Ethereum. Like if all of your top of revenue or service revenue is coming in at Ether, then I guess you know I'm not going to be revenue. Yeah, I mean, initially, and, and Ether is still kind of volatile, so. There's a lot of things you could do. You, you, could, you could sell the product for Ether, that'll have some kind of value. Of course, your, your own shares might have almost no value. This is a subcurrency you just cooked up after your campaign was successful. But the beauty of Ethereum is I can, theoretically, I can just issue subunits that, oh, this, this subcurrency unit is pegged to the US dollar in real time using this trusted data fee or, you know, uh, the euro based on this trusted and maybe I do all of my actual transactions using those tokens because as a store of value, great, but as a medium of exchange, I do business you know, in dollars and euro. I know what a Big Mac costs in dollars. If I'm actually doing the business on the blockchain, I want to take something that looks like a dollar because then my, my, you know, my consumer base can actually have some kind of understanding of what that's worth. Like, who can tell me what a Big Mac's worth in Bitcoin quickly? You know, and we all do this stuff. We don't know, you know, and it'll be different tomorrow too. So you can issue sub subunits of currency that are pegged to real world assets, and I would actually do the, the, the buying and selling of real goods using that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even sell it for either. Either should all that. Okay, guys, I think we're we're about the limit there. Thanks. Thank you.